Fernando Martin. He's going to talk about some theoretical calculation uh, involving H2 molecule using photosynthetic analysis. Before he starts, as you mentioned, this is a very heavy computation. I used to heard that uh, his partner responsible for the financial crisis in Spain in the last two years. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, we speak from uh, thanks to the support of the European Research Council who is funding our, our research. So, this work is, uh, has been done in collaboration with Alicia Palacios and Alberto Gonzalez-Castillo. So, uh, as you know, we are now close to having um, um, pulses in the X-ray and X-UV regime with a second or few femtosecond duration thanks to the new sources that make use of high harmonic generation and uh, free electron lasers. So, the idea is to use those pulses to uh, do some pump probe experiments and to know what you can learn from those experiments. And the idea of pump probe is, uh, comes from femtochemistry. So, in a typical pump probe experiment, what you do is you, to, to excite your molecule from the ground state and you induce some dynamics in the excited states of the molecule. And then later on, you, you probe these dynamics by uh, using another pulse that may excite the molecule more or ionize it. And then by varying the time delay between the pump and the probe, you expect to learn uh, how this molecule behaves in the excited state. And this technique was introduced by Sabayla and, and, and many other people. And, uh, and with these, they were able to, to, to see the movies of the nuclear motion. And the reason is that the duration of the pulses that were used in those days uh, were in the 10 second time scale, and typically they were using infrared pulses, also visible pulses. So, so the challenge was to reduce the duration of the pulses in order to see faster dynamics, in particular to see the, <coughs> the electronic motion, which uh, occurs in the upper second time scale. And for that, uh, there have been several, uh, several proposals and several experiments performed uh, that who uh, succeeded in, uh, in seeing uh, um, uh, dynamics in the sub femtosecond time scale. And some of those techniques make use of high harmonic generation. They analyze the harmonic emission, um, which uh, gives you an idea of the dynamics that is happening in the, in the sub cycle uh, duration. Uh, high harmonic generation can also be used to, uh, to, to, to generate single attosecond pulses or train of attosecond pulses that can be used at pump. Uh, pulses to excite some dynamics in the, in the molecule, and, uh, and then one can use the infrared pulse that is uh, used to generate the harmonics as a probe pulse, and by varying the time delay between these two pulses, one can also learn about the dynamics. And this can be done in the sub second time scale. And these are three examples that you can find in the literature where they have succeeded to see these uh, fast dynamics. Now, the advantage of these techniques is that, as I said, it's relatively easy to implement with high harmonic generation sources, not so easy with real electron lasers, and uh, that they provide some femtosecond temporal resolution. But the dynamics you observe by using these uh, techniques is mainly due to the infrared field. It's mainly the dynamics that is induced by the infrared field. And the reason is that the infrared field must be intense enough to generate a, a significant amount of, of harmonics. And, uh, and this means that, you know, the, the Kelvin's parameter for this uh, light is slightly larger than one. So that means that we are close to the tunneling regime, we are far from the perturbative regime, and that means that the dynamics to generate is in great part due to the infrared source. So, if you want to study the intrinsic molecular dynamics, I mean the dynamics that the molecule has by itself, then you have to use more gentle fields. And the ideal tool for that are XUV or X-ray at second pulses. So, because since the, the, the frequency is much, much larger, then the Kelvin parameter is much larger than one, and you are in the perturbative mm -hmm. regime, and therefore the dynamics you will observe will be almost entirely due to the intrinsic motion of the particles in the molecule. There have been already some uh, successful attempts 
to use each of the public simply prof uh, experiments. This is one uh, in which uh, uh, a free electron laser in, in Hamburg in, in yes, in Hamburg was used in the flash. And in these experiments, they uh, used two identical femtosecond pulses in the ETB. Uh, and the first pulse was used to ionize the D2 molecule and to generate D2 plus ion. And the weight packet that is generated by this ionization process is further probed by the second pulse, which is identical to the first one. And uh, since the duration of these pulses <coughs> at that time was of the order of tens of femtoseconds, the only dynamics that they could observe was due to the motion of the nuclear weight packet in the, um, in the ground state of H2+. So, what they observed in the experiment is this, um, when they plotted the, uh, uh, the ionization probability as a function of time delay and the proton kinetic energy, so they saw some oscillations in the spectrum that are more visible in the theoretical calculation that we presented. <laughs> <laughs> so, but still, you see oscillations here. And, uh, well, basically what you see, these oscillations follow the motion of this uh, nuclear wave packet that is created here and here. Okay, and so the kinetic energy of the proton uh, reflects uh, the position that this wave packet occurs in the potential energy curve. <coughs> so this was, this is just an example. And, uh, okay. Okay, just to show that it's a proof of principle experiment that shows that this is possible. You can see these dynamics, but of course the aim of this experiment is not to observe the nuclear motion, because for that we already have endochemistry. So, so the key question is to have XUV uh, pulses with, uh, that are shorter in time. So there is a recent work by a group of Dimitri Charalanidis in which they generated pulses of about one femtosecond duration and they performed pump proof experiment on the xenon atoms. And basically what they observed, they had enough time resolution to see the beginnings you know, of the, the wave packet evolution. In this case, it's the electronic wave packet. And uh, by calculating the Fourier transform of these beginnings, they observed the, the, the different frequencies associated to this uh, motion. Okay, so this is, uh, to my knowledge, the first experiment in which you have the necessary time of solution to see the electronic motion in an atom. Another thing that is important is that the intensity of the uh, pulses that are generated from high harmonic generation is increasing rapidly with time. <coughs> of course, in the case of free electron lasers, this intensity is large enough to have very nice statistics in your measurements. But in the case of high harmonic generation, it's not always the case. But there is a very recent work that appeared last week Communications by the Kawas group, in which they have succeeded in uh, generating um, uh, XUB pulses of attosecond duration with an intensity that is more or less two orders of magnitude larger than those existing in previous experiments. So, this will facilitate the use of these pulses in, in, in pump proof experiments in the future. So, our motivation is since the experimentalists seem to be ready or almost ready to do these pump probe experiments with the necessary time of solution, our motivation is to, to understand or to anticipate uh, if with this kind of approach we can access the electron in fast nuclear dynamics and molecules. And the, and the most important question is how we can access it. And, well, here I will provide theoretical answer by using the hydrogen molecule as a benchmark because for this molecule we are able to perform accurate calculations that have some predictive power. And we have used this method uh, for several years to predict and to explain some experimental results and this is the same method that we have used here in this context. Basically, what we, what we do is to solve the time-dependent Schrenger equation by using the exact non-relativistic feel-free Hamiltonian of the molecule. And this Hamiltonian includes all electronic degrees of freedom 
and the vibrational and dissociative degrees of freedom. So that means that we take into account the problem in full dimensionality and we are also taking into account the uh, correlation between the electrons and the coupling between the electronic and the neutral motion. <coughs> and uh, the way we solve this equation is by expanding the time dependent wave function in the basis of molecular states. Uh, in the case of the hydrogen molecule, we have three groups of states, those representing the bound states, the electronic bound states of the molecule multiplied by, by all the vibrational and dissociative states associated to them. We have a second group of states here that represent the ionization continuum of the molecule and also the vibrational and dissociative wave functions associated to them. And finally, we have a third group of states that represent the double-sided states that lie in the continuum of the hydrogen molecule. And in principle, by including an infinite number of terms here, you should get the exact answer. Of course, this is always impossible. And uh, we have to use a huge number of states here and check convergence by increasing the number of states we put in the calculation. Okay, so the idea we have explored is the following. Following previous experimental attempts, we propose a scheme in which you use two identical pulses, because this is the easiest thing to be experimental. So, and we choose the wavelength so that we excite from the ground state to the electronic excited states of the hydrogen molecule with one <coughs> photon. And then, since this transition is resonant, we cannot exclude that the second photon is absorbed from the same poles. And, uh, and this is possible for the intensities that are currently produced. So that means that you have one or two photon absorption and you generate a wave packet in the intermediate states here of hydrogen and a wave packet in the ionization continuum. And this wave packet is both electronic and neutral. So we let the system evolve with time. And that means that the wave packets will evolve, will change, will move. And later on, we come with a replica of the first pulse to probe the system. And then two things may happen. One is that we have a replica of the first process. So since the pulse is identical, we can excite the molecule to an excited state of, of H2. And we can absorb a second photon to ionize it directly from the same pulse. Or we can prove the wave packet that was created in the intermediate state by the first pulse. And this is the process that I will call sequential from now on. So these two processes coexist in this scheme. And as a result of this, there will be differences between the different wave packets that you create. And we will try to learn something about the interfaces that are <coughs> by using such a scheme. Okay, here are the results. Uh, so what I present here is the probability of ionization as a function of time delay between the pump and the probe pulses. The duration of the pulse we are using is this one femtosecond, more or less. And, and, the, and the intensity is typically 10 to the 10 watts per centimeter squared. So as you can see here, as a function of time, we see some quite complicated structure with beatings of different frequencies. <coughs> and we see some revivals every 30 femtoseconds. The other quantity I want to <coughs> explore is the doubly differential yield. Doubly differential in the electron and proton energies. And this is something that you can nowadays measure by using multi-coincidence techniques like, for instance, cold trips. And I, here I focus only on, the, on this part of uh, short time delays because uh, what we observe here is, is replicated or is, comes back again in the other parts where we see maxima in the total ionization yield. So these figures you, sh you see here will be very similar to the ones we would observe at time delays of the other 30 femtoseconds or 60 femtoseconds and so on. And as you can see here, this is a very complicated pattern. You know, so we see that uh, as a function of the time delay, there are more and more structures appearing. There are, they look like interferences. They are in interferences, as I, as I anticipated before. And what we would like to do is to understand the origin of this and where is the intrinsic molecular dynamics hidden in 
this spectrum. Okay, so to understand the different features that uh, one will observe in an ideal experiment like uh, the one I have presented, we have developed a simple model in which we, we assume that the uh, probability of ionization <coughs> is the square of two terms. <coughs> the first one represents the direct ionization process, the, the process that results from absorption of two photons, and the second one is the sequential one. In the first one, we have the amplitude for direct two photon absorption, and this amplitude is multiplied by one and at the exponential of the energy difference between the ground state and the final state. And this is multiplied by the time delay total. So the reason why we have two terms here is that is because, as I said, the pump pulse ionizes the molecule, and the probe pulse comes later and produces a replica of this process. And so, and this replica occurs the time with the time delay power. <coughs> the second term represents the sequential process. And this sequential process contains the amplitudes for the, uh, for the sequential process and the exponentials of the energy differences between the uh, uh, intermediate states and the final state. Now in these equations, I want to emphasize that what I call uh, energy of the final state is the sum of the electron energy and the nuclear energy. So it's a double differential uh, energy. Okay, so when we square this expression, then we will end up with three terms. One is the square of the direct term, the other one is the square of the sequential term, and the interference term. And I have to say that uh, this equation is only valid if the ground state population remains equal to one for all times, which is reasonable for uh, these uh, intensities and these wavelengths we are using here because we are in the perturbative regime, and that no more than two photons are absorbed, which is again a reasonable approximation in the perturbative regime. Okay, so when we square this, this, this is the form of the different terms that appear. For the direct term, we see here that the, uh, this is proportional to the cosinus of the energy difference between the initial and final state. For the sequential term, we see here um, cosinus of the energy differences between the vibrational states and the electronic states that lie in the, here in this region. And for the interference terms, we have two different uh, uh, periodic functions. One depends on the energy differences between the ground state and the uh, intermediate states, and the other one between the intermediate states and the final states. So this is so for the W differential uh, probabilities. If we integrate in order to get the total ionization yield, this model predicts that the direct term should be more or less constant and that the sequential term should depend only on the energy differences between states that are excited by the pump poles and the interference term depends as it oscillates with the frequency that depends on the energy difference between the intermediate state and the ground state. And in order to obtain this very simple expression, all we have to assume is that the amplitudes vary very slowly with electron energy and nuclear energy. Okay? So this is, these are the, the assumptions of the model, and these are the equations that come from this model. And we are going to use this model in order to understand the results I showed before. Before doing so, I want to emphasize a very important aspect. Um, what I showed before, the total ionization yield as a function of time delay. Here, what you can see is that the composition into the dissociative and non-dissociative parts of this total yield. And as you can see, they look very similar to the total ionization yield. Here you have a blow up of this region in which you can see that the oscillations go in phase for the two channels. So, in the discussion I will present later, I will focus entirely on the total ionization yield because the explanation is the same for the others. Okay, here what you can, see, uh, you can see again is the result of the calculation, and this is the contribution of the different terms we obtain from the model. And as you can see, the direct term remains more or less constant as predicted by this formula. For the sequential term, we see an oscillating function with a periodicity of around 30 femtoseconds. And for the interference term, we see that this oscillates around zero, and the frequency of this oscillation is very high because this energy difference is very, is very large. And so this term oscillates, as I said, around zero, so on average, this remains close to zero all the time. 
Now, of course, these cannot be extracted from an experiment, but we know that the beatings we see here, the two beatings we see here, the, the one that takes longer comes from the sequential uh, process, and the one that takes, uh, you know, that oscillates faster comes from interference between the direct and the sequential. So the first thing you would do is, uh, okay, let's take this and calculate the Fourier transform. When you do so, well, you see here some sign up around 12 electron volts. Well, this is telling us that as we, as we know, we are exciting states that are at around 12 electron volts from the ground state. So it's telling us that indeed what we are populating is the B, the B, the signal you state. Now, but if you want to learn more, what you can do is a short time Fourier transform. So if we use a, a, a bump pass function with some time week, and we do this work and call then we see that we see these three uh, spots here, and we see that the separation between these three spots is around 30 femtoseconds. This is precisely the time the wave packet, the nuclear wave packet, takes in the in the in the B prime sigma U state to go back and forth. And we see that this wave packet, you know, moves in the state of these 12 electron volts above the ground state. So with this pro procedure, we are able to, to see that the nuclear wave packet moves, we see the frequency uh, of this motion, and we know precisely in which state is produced. Well, this is nice, but it's not so interesting because uh, we only excite one state, so it's much better, much richer to see. If we use higher photon energies so that we can excite several electronic states here, we are really producing an electronic wave packet and a nuclear mo mo motion superimposed to <coughs> So when we do so, the totalization G looks uh, more complicated, but then we can repeat the procedure and calculate the short time to Fourier transform. And what we see here is again the three spots we saw uh, before uh, at around 12 electron volts and separated by 30 femtoseconds, more or less. So this is again telling us that there is part of the wave packet that is moving in the in the B state. And we see another feature here at around 14. <coughs> electron volts that corresponds to the motion in the B prime state and this motion, the periodicity of this motion is around 20 femtoseconds. And this is this is telling us that the uh, nuclear wave packet that moves in this B prime state takes only 20 femtoseconds. So by doing this analysis we have a full picture of the electronic and nuclear wave packet that we create. And we are sure that this is the origin of this because the model I propose is telling us that this comes precisely from the sequential process I mentioned here. The B, the B prime state is uh, associated to one place? Uh, B prime is this one over here. <coughs> it's, uh, it, it dissociates here. It's, uh, it dissociation, one dissociation the 2S excited hydrogen and the 2S and the other one MTP. Okay, so what this figure is telling us in addition is not only that the, the main components of the wave packet, it disentangles the different components of the wave packet, electronic components and nuclear components, but it's also telling us that by using a specific time delays, we can, we can uh, selectively choose the motion in one state or the other or on both. So in this way, we could control this uh, motion in the, in, the, in the hydrogen molecule. Now let's go now to the uh, W differential in this <coughs> and use. I put here again the W differential <coughs> spectra, that would be very complicated. And on top of it, what you see is a, is a cartoon <coughs> of the, you know, the position that the wave packet occupies here in the intermediate state when the, the probe pulse arrives at, at this uh, time delay, two femtoseconds, three femtoseconds, up to eight femtoseconds. And, uh, well, as you can see, this is very complicated. So the first thing we would like to see is what is the contribution of the different processes to this spectrum. Well, we know that the formula given by the model are these ones. And I want to emphasize that in addition to these two uh, beatings we observed in the total deal, we have two additional beatings that disappeared when we integrated over electron and nuclear energy. So these beatings are responsible for this richer structure. And the contribution of these three different terms to the total, to the W differential yield is given by these figures. So here you can see the direct term that looks very complicated. Here is the sequential term, and here is the interference term. It's 
as you can see, in the case of uh, as it is in the case of the total ionization yield. Well, here you see blue and red. This means that we have positive and negative values everywhere. So, on average, this would be very difficult to observe. Okay. Okay. So, the first thing you may notice here is this spot here that is moving. So we can we can look at it again. Okay. So, so this spot comes, as we will see, from the fact that ionization can proceed through two ionization thresholds. One is the white CMG, the other one is 2PC minus. And this feature over here comes from ionization through the 2PC minus threshold. And the way to see it is just to plot the result we obtain when we separate the one sigma g and the two pc minus contributions. And then, as you can see, this is the total. Uh, spectrum in this channel, and this is the contribution of the three different terms. As you can see, this structure comes entirely from the sequential process. And, uh, and this is because this is simply the imaging of the wet packet that is generated by the pump poles in these intermediate states by the 2P sigma, 2P sigma U state, which is repulsive. So in some way, this is imaging. It's the same kind of imaging I presented at the beginning of my talk that uh, people used to see the motion of the nuclear wave packet in the ground state of H2+. So the idea is exactly the same. So I will not spend more time on this particular, on this particular model. All I will say again is that this represents the imaging of the intermediate nuclear wave packet. So that means that the interesting stuff is in the other channel. So one can subtract rather easily the contribution from the 2PC by U channel by using you know, a simple approximation, which is the reflection approximation, in which by calculating simply Frankfurt factors, you can remove this uh, this spot from the spectrum, remove it, and then what you will be left is this thing. Here we see that the contribution, the direct term, accounts for most of the fringes and uh, interfaces we see here. And although they look very ugly and very complicated, they are perfectly displayed by this simple formula that comes from our model. So if you take this formula and you give uh, values to the, uh, to the electron energy and the nuclear energy and you plot the result, you will obtain something that looks very similar to what comes from our calculation. So in fact, this looks very complicated, but it's very easy to remove from the spectrum you measure. Now, the other thing that uh, then probably will not be observed or with the average is the interference term because as I said, you know, you have positive and negative contributions all over, you know, the range of uh, variation of this uh, ionization probability. So once you have removed these, what I call the Ramsey features, and you have removed the trivial motion of the nuclear wave packet in the in the intermediate state, what is left is this. Okay, and this shows some dynamics. What is this? Well, this is nothing else than the dynamics induced by auto-ionizing states. So in fact, what you see here is that at short time delays, you see that the, here, the second photon can excite one of these repulsive states that you see here. This is the lowest double excited state of the hydrogen molecule. And then you, you wait a little bit, you can still excite this state or even another uh, auto ionization state that lies close to it. But after some time, you know, the photon energy does not match anymore the energy difference between the intermediate state and the double sided state, so we don't see it anymore. So what you see here at short time delays is the contribution from auto ionization. So this is revealing the contribution of ionization to the wave packet that is created and to the wave packet that is in the, in the final state. Now, in order to, if you are an experimentalist and you cannot do calculations, you can still do some modeling and check that this is true, that, that this corresponds indeed to the double side state. So what we did was to develop a simple model in which we described ionization by assuming that the nuclei follow semi classical paths. So that means that when we excite the molecule, let's say, for instance, with a photon of 20 CPDs, then the system can evolve through two different paths. 
one corresponds to direct ionization, the other one to auto ionization. And these two paths must lead to the same final state and therefore can interfere. So if we put the equations here, you know, we have the contributions from the two paths that interfere. And the only <coughs> thing we, we must know is the, the, the phase, the, the, the classical phase that describes those motions of the nuclei. And here you can see that this comes from the WKB uh, uh, expressions, except for the fact that in the case of the uh, path in the organization st in the organizing state, we have an imaginary term that describes the decay of this state due to the <coughs> due to the fact that this state has a weak gamma. Okay, when we use uh, this equation, then we obtain this, which looks very close to uh, what we observe here. So you can identify that this is really due to organization from the lowest Q1 double sided state. If you use the model by choosing a different double sided state, you see that this does not fit uh, at all with this. So you are sure that what you have here is uh, the signature of the wave packet in the lowest double sided state of hydrogen. <coughs> okay, so that means that again by controlling the time delay between the, uh, the pump and the pulse, you can uh, also control the electronic wave packet. And you can have a wave packet with a large contribution of modernization or a wave packet with almost no contribution from organization. Okay, to conclude, I would like to say that for a QB pump uh, infrared probe schemes, although very successful in revealing sulfentosecond dynamics, still they only give us information about the dynamics that is driven by the uh, strong infrared field, or mainly due to the strong infrared field. While in QB pump it should be probe schemes, you can reveal the intrinsic molecular dynamics because the molecules will be perturbed by these uh, uh, laser sources. Now the price you have to pay is that these dynamics is superimposed to interferences arising from different processes leading to the same final state. And this is so when you use two identical pulses, which is, you know, so far the only uh, method that has been used experimentally. Uh, however, this is not a big problem, because you can rely on simple models like the one I have introduced here to remove these interferences that do not provide any information about the dynamics of the molecule. And what I have also shown is that by variable time delay, indeed, if you have sulfentosecond time to solution, you have a way to control the electronic and nuclear impact in the molecule. And there is a, a first experimental attempt in progress by uh, the group of activity of the Charles Bidis, in which, uh, of course, the uh, the results are not so uh, nice as the, 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 the flow cycle here, but that showed that some dynamics is indeed going on uh, in this system uh, by using the pump to control the methods. And I would like to finish my advertising in case you haven't seen this nice uh, uh, <laughs> this one here. That we are organizing the international conference on electronic economy and photonic conditions in, in Toledo, Spain, not Ohio. <laughs> uh, don't be wrong with the continent. In 2015, in summer 2015, so you are welcome to come and participate. Thank you very much. I will be a brief question. So you mentioned that for your simulation you use something like 10 to 10 watts per square centimeter. Mm. Do you have a feeling what is the absolute ionization probability for hydrogen molecule for pump and probes so to photons? Well, it was uh, the scale. I think the scale was there. Uh, so we can give numbers. So it's uh, the absolute. So it's small, but not so so small. This is for the total ionization unit. 10 to minus 4. 10 to the minus 4. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not atomic unit, it's uh, 10 to the minus 4. 10 to the minus 4, probability? Yeah. Okay. This, this is 10 to the minus 4. Because this is a, you know, this is a ionization. Typical cross section, sorry. Typical cross section for modernization about 10 to the minus 2. So this is square. No, but this is a, no, but this is probability. Probability. Yeah, but we need to over the cross head.
This is probability. It's very high because the first photon, the first photon is absorbed rationally. So between the ground state and the, and the excited states, because of the bandwidth, you always have some electronic states that are, you know, that are populated by absorption of one photon. It is a resonant transition. Then the second photon is absorbed from this state. So it's like a resonant resonance enhanced two photon ionization. Well this is ten to the ten what we use for around ten to the ten. I don't remember if it's exactly ten to the ten. Of course if you if you increase the uh, the intensity you get higher probabilities. So I mean in the case of total ionization yields these I think this is perfectly measurable. Now in the case of the double differential yields well things are not so obvious because probability is much smaller of course because it's double differential. So here you have the numbers. Uh, but still okay this is 10 to the minus 3 in this region. It's not so bad. But this is differential. This is differential probability. Differential probability. This would be much harder. Not only sure because uh, you, you, it's much smaller but also because, well, look, all, I mean, the resolution you should have in order to see. You will never see that. But you will see this spot here, okay? These spots and how this moves, and you will see also how this evolves. So you could always come with this formula I gave by using your energy resolution and remove the contribution of these trivial Ramsey features. I like your idea of subtracting the not so interesting stuff, so to speak. But this works, of course, very well in theory. I mean, for a theoretically generated spectrum. My question is, what's your expectation? How well would that work with respect to the experimental spectrum? Okay, we, we thought about that. Um, well, in the case of a diatomic molecule, it should not be complicated. For instance, to subtract.